Hi, I'm Dr. J and this is a video about regression and in particular about the use of interactions within a regression model. As usual, there's a, a link up here to the playlist that's all about regression and a link down below to a PDF version of these slides. Now, two explanatory variables are said to interact if the effect of one of the explanatory variables depends on the level of the other explanatory variable. And in that situation, we need to have a multiple regression model that's a little bit more sophisticated than the models that we've seen so far within this playlist. So just as a couple of examples here, the first example that we saw in a previous video talked about long nose days, and it talked about the effect of nitrate and the maximum depth of a stream on the abundance or count of those long nose days. And now if you believe that the effect of nitrate depends on max depth, or that the effect of max depth depends on nitrate, then you should use an interaction in that model. In this example, we have both of the explanatory variables are continuous. So we have a continuous, continuous interaction. The next example uh, that we haven't seen before, but this is going to be an example that looks at energy expenditure of uh, animals in flight. And so in particular, we're talking about birds and bats, and we are wondering about the effect of mass of those individuals on their energy expenditure, and whether that mass depends on the species type in terms of the energy expended. And if we think, yes, that the, the effect of mass depends on the type, then we should have an interaction. But in this case, only mass is continuous and the type is categorical. So we have a continuous categorical interaction. Finally, we, uh, haven't, we've seen examples like this before. Uh, if we're looking at crop yield and we think that the tillage method uh, or the effective tillage method depends on the fertilizer brand, let's say, that's used, then we want to include an interaction. But in this example, both tillage method and brand of the fertilizer are both categorical variables, so we have a categorical, categorical interaction. And throughout this video, the plan is to go through basically these three examples and these three scenarios of the different types of interactions. Continuous, 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 categorical, and categorical, categorical. All right, so let's start with the continuous, continuous example. All right, so in the example we had, we had a multiple regression model where our response was y, and we have an explanatory variable x1 and a different explanatory variable x2. Now, if we do not have an interaction, then this is similar to a model that we've seen before. We just have the intercept beta naught, we have beta one, the coefficient for x1, and beta two, the coefficient for x2. And this is often referred to as the main effects model. That is a model with no interaction. If we want to include an interaction, what we do is we just add a third beta, so we have a beta three, and we have x1 times x2. So we literally take the product of those two explanatory variables, and that is the model with an interaction. What I would like to do now is to think about how you can interpret the parameters in these two models. So we've got a main effects model and a model with an interaction. So we'll first think about how do you interpret the main effects model and then how do you interpret the interaction model. All right, and to do that, what I'm going to think about is to take the first equation that is for the main effects model and just think about it as an equation for x1. So just think about x2 perhaps as a constant. All right, and then I'm going to rearrange that main effects model and I'm going to write the intercept beta naught with the x2 term, so with plus beta 2 x2. And then we have left over the plus beta 1 times x1. And so what this, the idea of this rearrangement is going to do is that if x2 is constant, then what we have is an intercept that's beta naught plus beta 2 times x2 plus a slope beta 1 for x1. And it, what the effect of beta, sorry, what the effect of x2 has on the equation is that it just shifts the intercept, right? Notice that if you change x2, the slope always stays the same, but that intercept changes. Okay? And now we could think about this the other direction and think about it just as an equation for x2, with x1 being constant. Now we can see the slope for the line relative to x2 is beta 2, and that the only effect that x1 has is on changing the intercept for this line. All right, now in contrast, if we think about the model with an interaction, then uh, here's a situation that we have. 
where we are combining the terms that have to do with uh, x1 and that don't have to do with x1. So we have that same intercept out there, beta naught plus beta 2 x2. But then we have a coefficient for x2 that is beta 1 plus beta 3 times x2. And what we can see now is that both the intercept and the slope depend on the value for x2. And so we said earlier that the effect of one of the variables depends on the value of the other. That's what we we're showing right here. So the effect of x1 is beta 1 plus beta 3 times x2, and that depends on the value for x2. Now we can do the opposite situation. We can look at this as a line for x2. We have a similar scenario where we have the same intercept, and now the coefficient or the slope for x2 is beta 2 plus beta 3 times x1, and so the effect of x2 depends on the value for x1. All right, so uh, here's very quickly how you might fit these models in R. The key takeaway I want to show you is that if you want the main effects model, you put the plus sign between our two explanatory variables, and when we get the results, we get three lines corresponding to our beta naught, beta 1, and beta 2. If we do the interaction model, then we change that plus to a, uh, an asterisk, which is the multiplication symbol. And so that multiplication symbol creates the interaction between nitrate and max depth. And you'll see now an additional line uh, that corresponds to that beta 3 coefficient. You'll also notice that the parameter estimates change, right? There's sort of no uh, easy relationship between the coefficients in the main effects model versus the coefficients in an interaction model. All right, so let's take a look at a picture because maybe that will help firm up ideas here. On the left, we have the situation where we have the main effects model, and on the right, we have the interaction model. On the x-axis, we have nitrate, NO3. On the y-axis, here we have count. This is the count for the long nose dace. And then the different lines that we have are at three different values for max depth. And now we could have chosen any values for max depth, so the choices we made here are arbitrary. But the key is that when we have a main effects model, you see that the lines are parallel, right? That corresponds to the idea that all we're doing is changing the intercept, right? But the slope stays constant as we're changing max depth. On the right-hand side, uh, we have the model with the interaction, and you notice that these lines are not parallel, right? And because of the interaction model, those lines could be whatever they want. Uh, it just is... Uh, lucky and maybe unlucky perhaps that all the lines come together at zero. That was definitely not enforced um, and you'll see further examples later where that doesn't happen, right? So it's not that that always happens, but that just happened to happen in this example. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the situation where we have a categorical explanatory variable and a continuous explanatory variable. Right, so here's that example. We're looking at energy expenditure for uh, bats and birds. And in particular for bats, we have two different kinds of bats. We have echolocating bats uh, that use echolocation and the non-echolocating bats. And so you, what you see here in the different colors and plot, uh, I guess, symbols it are the three different groups. So you'll see the echolocating bats in the red circles. You'll see the I uh, believe it's the non echolocating birds are the squares. Uh, I think that's blue. And then we have the green triangles are the non echolocating bats. And um, so what we're thinking about now is whether or not we need an interaction to deal with differences in terms of the effective mass on energy that depend on type. Okay. All right. So uh, here's going to be the setup to talk about this example. Uh, we're going to have a categorical variable uh, and we have a continuous variable. So x is going to be our continuous variable. And then we're going to have three categories, just as an example, for our categorical variable or three levels. We're going to have a, b, and c. We're going to choose a to be our reference level, which means we need to create dummy variables for the b and c uh, levels of that categorical variable. Those dummy variables are going to be b and c, as indicated here. Now you could think about constructing a main effects model. The main effects model just has a term associated with each of those uh, explanatory variables we have up there. So we have the coefficient for x is beta 1, the coefficient for b is beta 2, the coefficient for c is beta 3. If we want to include an interaction, we're sort of thinking about taking the product 
except that we can't take the product of a continuous and, and categorical variable. And so what we're actually going to do is very similar though. We're going to construct two additional terms, one for each of the dummy variables that we had for the categorical variable. And we're going to multiply those by the continuous variable, uh, in this case, x. So the two terms we've added in that interaction model are the beta 4 times x times b plus beta 5 times x times c. All right, and so let's talk now about how this affects the, the interpretation of the parameters. And we're going to again go through the main effects model and then the interaction model. In the main effects model, we have this setup. Uh, if we're thinking about this as a function of x, then we have a common slope for x, right? The coefficient for x is always just beta 1. And what the category does is it changes the intercept. So we had intercept for category A, that's the reference level, it's just beta naught. The intercept for B is beta naught plus beta 2. And the intercept for C is beta naught plus beta 3. But in every case, the slope of that line is the same just like we saw with the continuous continuous interaction. The other variable just changes the intercept. If we now move on to thinking about the interaction model, right, we add those additional two terms, and if we try to construct those same lines, this is the same table, but now with the interaction model. And you'll notice here in this table that the slope doesn't stay constant, right? The slope depends on the category. So if the category is A, then the slope is B beta one, Category is B, the slope is beta 1 plus beta 4. If the category is C, then the slope is beta 1 plus beta 5. Uh, the intercept also changes just like we had in that main effects model. And so what this model really does is it just allows that every category has its own line. Right? There's essentially no relationship between those lines uh, in this model. Okay. All right, so uh, here's the code to do this in R. Um, so first off, you'll notice here that for this example, it makes more sense to take the log of the response and the log of mass, and so we're doing that in the example. If we want the main effects model and we want to include a categorical variable, we just do plus that categorical variable, in this case plus type. You'll see here the four lines corresponding to the beta naught, beta 1, beta 2, and beta 3 that we have uh, in uh, our example main effects model that we're using. If we want to include the interaction, we just include that, or we just change the plus symbol to that asterisk, that multiplication symbol, and that adds two additional lines that correspond to the interaction. You'll see that in R, that interaction is indicated by colons. So we have log mass colon, the type for non-echolocating bats, and then for non-echolocating birds, as those two additional betas, just like with the previous model, there's no relationship between the betas in the main effect model and the betas in the interaction model. If we look at this as a picture, this is what we get for this particular data set. Again, on the left side, we have the main effects model. On the right side, we have the interaction model. In each case, we have mass on the x-axis. We have energy on the y-axis. You notice that both axes have been log transformed, or they are on a log scale. Um, You'll see on the main effects model that there's three lines there and they all have exactly the same slope and they vary by just the intercept. In this example, they don't vary by much, right? That intercept is very close, so it almost looks like a single line, but in fact, there are three lines there. On the interaction plot, you'll see that there are three lines and those three lines are completely distinct from each other. Basically, they are just fit to their own data, so that is for the uh, birds, you have a line. For the echolocating bats, you have a line. And for the non-echolocating bats, you have yet a different line. All right, so you've seen in these first two examples that basically what happens when you have an interaction and at least one of the variables is continuous is that you have parallel lines for the main effects model and non-parallel lines for the interaction model. All right, now we're going to move on to a third example. And then in this third example, uh, which doesn't relate to the example that I had at the previous, uh, the very first slide. Uh, we're going to be talking about an example where there was an experiment that was run out in the ocean that looked at seaweed regeneration. Uh, they had three different treatments that had to do with the type of animals that could get into uh, those particular units. So L is for limpids, F, little f is for small fish, and big f is for big fish. Uh, and then this experiment was a block experiment where the whole experiment was replicated in this block and in this block and so forth. 
Um, this happens to be a very small subset of the overall data set that exists. So if you go to the Sleuth 3R package and look at case 1301, you'll see a uh, much more expansive data set. All right, so, but in this example, the key thing that I want you to take away is that we have two categorical variables. We have treatment, right, the L, LF, LFF, and we have the block, block one and block two. And so now we want to think about the possibility of constructing either a main effects or interaction model in this context. In order to uh, construct sort of the same kind of model that we've seen before, we're going to have a categorical variable that has levels A, B, and C. Then we're going to have a different categorical variable that has levels 0 and 1. And so like we did before, we have the B and C are dummy variables for category, category or level, I should say, B and C. And then we have an additional dummy variable that replaces our continuous variable in the previous example. This dummy variable is an indicator that the level is one. So in this example, uh, we have a reference level that's category A and type zero, okay? All right, so now let's think about what this model looks like. It's gonna look very similar to the previous model that we had. We're just going to replace X with one. So for our main effects model, we have three terms intercept, coefficient for one, coefficient for B, coefficient for C. If we have the interaction model, right? Now again, we're thinking about the product, but we have a product of two categorical variables, which doesn't work. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the product of each of the indicators. So here we've added the two terms, beta four times the indicator of one and the indicator of B, plus beta five times the indicator of one times the indicator of C. All right, so now we want to think about how do we interpret these parameters. And so we're going to uh, take our main effects model, and what we're going to think about is what is the expected value of the response for every combination of category and type. So here's the table. We have category along the columns, and we have type down the rows. And we can just figure out by putting in the dummy variables, the zeros and ones, for the appropriate category and type. And we can find that this table represents the expected response for every combination of type and category. So for instance, if you're the reference level, category A type zero, then the expected response is just beta naught. If you're category B, then you have beta naught plus beta two. If you're category C, beta naught plus beta three. And now uh, I've tried to include spaces here so that you can see what's going on. And in particular, what you see is that anytime you move from category A to category B, you add a beta two. So you can see both in that first row and in the second row, if you move from the first column to the second column, that is category A to B, you add beta two. If you go from category A to category C, you always add a beta three. If you go from type zero down to type one, you always add a beta one. And so this is the equivalent of that idea of just moving the intercept, right? You'll notice here that in every time we move down a column or down a row, right? that we will add the same value for that same move. Now, in contrast, if we're talking about the interaction model, but we go through the same process of identifying those means, so we have this table, and now it's a bit more complicated because we have more terms, but the main takeaway point is that that relationship does not exist. If you move from the first column, that is category A, to category B, uh, you don't add the same value, right? If it's type zero, you add beta two, but if it's type one, then you add beta two plus beta four. If you go from category A to category C, right? If it's type zero, you add beta three. If it's category type one, you add beta three plus beta five, right? And so the final result of the interaction model is that the means can be whatever that combination says they should be, and there's no relationship between those combinations. Okay, sometimes this is referred to as a cell means model, because these six cells in this table all have their own mean, okay? All right, so in R, if you wanna fit this, um, just like we saw before, if you want the main effects model, you use the plus sign. Here you'll see the four lines that, sorry, five lines. Sorry, four lines, there we go. Uh, they're associated with our intercept beta naught, our coefficient in this case for block two, and our coefficient for treatment LF and coefficient for treatment LFF. Okay, if we want the interaction model, we just do the uh, multiplication symbol, that asterisk, and we add two additional lines for the interaction between those categorical variables represented here by 
All right, beta 2 colon treatment LF, and sorry, not beta, B2, uh, so block B2 colon treatment LF, and block B2 colon treatment LFF. All right, so it might be helpful to visualize what's going on here. This is a picture that helps visualize, just like before, main effects on the left, interaction on the right. Uh, on the x-axis here, we have the three different treatments in both of those facets. On the y-axis, we have the uh, cover. This is the measure of seaweed regeneration. Um, and what you'll see here uh, is that on the main effects model, the lines are parallel. And now this is a little bit deceiving, but you'll notice that the x-axis, the ordering is really arbitrary, right? So we could have put LF first and then L and then LFF or so forth, right? So we could have had any ordering there. And so the fact that these two lines in the left plot are it, it sort of perfectly parallel is not as important as the fact that they are parallel within each segment. That is from L to LF, they're parallel. And then from LF to LFF, they are also parallel. So in a different set, an example or a different ordering of the x-axis, you would have seen parallel lines, but they would have only been parallel within those segments. In contrast, in the interaction model, now the means are allowed to be wherever they want to be. And you'll see distinctly that these lines within the segments are not parallel whatsoever. All right, so um, there's always then the question of, all right, when do I include an interaction? And so this is a nice summary that I took from the Statistical Sleuth, which I've been saying I think is a great textbook. Um, so number one, include an interaction when your scientific question uh, requires the interaction, when that's what it answers your scientific question. So if you're asking a question about does the effect of X depend on the effect, the level of Z, right? That's the kind of thing that requires an interaction. You would also probably want to include interaction if you, there's a good reason to suspect that an interaction exists, like previous research. If previous research has demonstrated interaction, you probably should include an interaction. And then finally, um, you might want to add an interaction to assess the goodness of fit of your current model. That is to see whether you think an interaction or some other fancier model is necessary. All right, so to wrap up uh, these last two videos, which were all about multiple regression, where we introduced the ideas of adding additional explanatory variables, and in this video, the idea of adding interactions, right? That creates a wide uh, and um, very useful collection of models that can be used within the multiple regression model framework. Now, this is not as far as you can go. You can go even farther. We did interactions where there are multiples of two explanatory variables, but there's no reason you have to stop there. You could add another one. You could include an explanatory variable and the log of that explanatory variable, right? There are issues when you do that, but you have a lot of flexibility with how you can go about modeling using this multiple regression framework. All right, we're gonna start moving on to talk about uh, other ways of summarizing data in these multiple regression models. We're gonna talk about things like ANOVA and contrast. Hope to catch you there.